Imagine waking up one day and receiving a call from a person telling you that you are a superstar, a legend in his country, without you having any idea of what he's talking about. Well, that happened to this man, let me tell his story. Once upon a time, in 1968, Denis Coffey and Mike Theodore, two music producers, go to a bar to have a drink together. And while chatting, they realize that beyond the noise of glasses, conversation and all the bustle of the city, someone is singing in the bar. They listen to this voice and are amazed. They really find that this voice has something special. So they decide to approach to hear better. Now they hear the words that this voice recites, and once again, they are shocked by the beauty of them. They absolutely want to talk to this person. It's impossible for them to overlook this extraordinary musician. They still haven't seen him because of the thick smoke in the bar. They go talk to him, and after discussing together, they sign this artist to their label, Sussex Records. Because for them, he's not just any musician. He really have something special, like he's considered equivalent in talent to Bob Dylan. For Denise and Mike, he is the most intriguing person they have ever seen. So they decide to bet everything on him. In 1977, an Australian label called Blue Goose Music comes across the albums of a certain Rodriguez. They acquired the rights and created the album at his best, which combined two Rodriguez's albums into one, including some unreleased tracks. It gained a modest but a growing popularity in Australia and New Zealand, and people there start to hear about this Rodriguez whom they never had heard of before. And at that moment, we don't know how and I guess we never will, but the album Cold Fact leaked all the way to South Africa. During that period in South Africa, there was a party. For those who don't know what it is, basically, the whites came to South Africa and said, this is our home now. They took control of the territory and decided to create laws that separated black from white people. In response to this discrimination, people decide to revolt. It was in this context of revolt that Rodriguez's music emerged in South Africa and played a significant role in the fight against apartheid. Rodriguez's music was highly political and it was the first time that people in South Africa at that moment heard such political charged lyrics, such anti-social lyrics in music. The mayor hides a crime rate, councilwoman hesitates, public gets irate, but forgets the vote dates, weatherman complaining, predicted sun it's raining, everyone's protesting, boyfriend keeps suggesting, you're not like all of the rest. The system's gonna fall soon to an angry young tune, and that's a concrete cool fact. The government censored and controlled almost everything, and Rodriguez's songs became anthems of revolution and liberation because at the time, all media were controlled by the state. If you criticized the government, you were sent to jail for three years. Countries all over the world criticized the apartheid policy and South Africa was isolated from the rest of the world. Some South African producers somehow acquired the rights to distribute Rodriguez's album and at that moment, Rodriguez experienced tremendous success in South Africa. However, the government wasn't pleased with this movement and banned Rodriguez's music. They even scratched the record to prevent people from listening to them. Because with this music, young people understand that they have the rights to be against all that. That they can oppose this injustice discrimination, which seems obvious to us now, but at that moment, without someone setting the example, you just don't do it or you just don't dare. And, for many years, Rodriguez's music had a great impact in South Africa and tremendous commercial success. It sold over 500,000 albums, not even counting all the piracy that must have been done by hundreds of thousands. A figure that is impossible to estimate. Half a million may not seem like much, but for South Africa, it's enormous. 
Rodriguez's popularity is so immense in South Africa at that time, people there knew Rodriguez more than Elvis Presley. I don't know if you realize the level. Everyone knew him, everyone had learned his songs, everyone had one of his albums at home, but nobody knew his life. For all other artists of the time, there were magazines talking about them, interviews, filmed concerts, but for Rodriguez, there was absolutely nothing. So stories circulate that he had committed suicide during a concert, that he had set himself on fire, that he had died in prison, etc. And all these tales, all this mystery surrounding him, elevate him to the status of legend of music. 30 years later, in 1997, people begin to investigate Rodriguez because they are certain that he's dead, but we know nothing about him. People want to know the truth about how he died. So a journalist and a record store owner team up to investigate and gather the few credible leads they have amid hundreds of stories about the mysterious Rodriguez. And it's by following the money from Rodriguez's record sales that Stephen Sugarman and his associate Craig Bartholomew Stridham manage to get in touch with Sussex Records. They learn that Rodriguez is unknown in the United States that none of his albums have been successful there. Despite him being a superstar, a legend in South Africa. And on the website dedicated to this investigation, at the very end they call for witnesses with a text along the lines of if anyone has any information about this person, please contact us. After some time, when they had no more leads to find Rodriguez, Stephen Sugarman receives a message on the dedicated investigation webpage from a woman saying Rodriguez is my father. She says she's willing to talk about him and leaves her phone number. Upon reading this, Stephen is shocked by what he had just read. He can't believe it and decides to contact this person. The alleged daughter of Rodriguez confirms Yes, he's my father. And he's not dead. Once again, Stephen is shocked by what he has just heard and it leads to the most extraordinary conversation he has ever had. In the end, he thanks Eva Rodriguez and tells her that it will be an immense pleasure for him to be able to talk with her father. And one o'clock in the morning that night, the phone rang and my wife answered it because it was her side of the bed and I remember she picked up the phone and her face, she changed, she had this look of awe, she said, it's here. And I, I, I was in shock. I'd been sleeping and I ran into the other room, into my study, and I picked up the phone and she put hers down and I said, hello. And a voice said, hello, is that sugar? And I knew. I just knew because I knew that voice. I'd heard that voice so many times on the records. I knew it was him. I was talking to Rodriguez. That for me was one of the greatest moments of my life. Stephen decides to go meet Rodriguez. tell him everything, absolutely everything. When Rodriguez hears this, he can't believe it. Because for him, it's been 30 years since he stopped making music. In the 70s and 80s, did you ever get any contact from South Africa? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, um, maybe they didn't have a contact number or something, but no, I didn't. How does that feel? You weren't aware of something that would have changed your life completely. I mean, probably to the better. Well, I don't know if it, was, it would have been for the better, but it's certainly a, a thought, you know. But wouldn't it have been nice to know that you were a superstar? Uh, well... I don't know what to respond to that. After coming from reality, did you want to continue making albums? I would like to continue, but uh, 
Uh, nothing beats reality, so uh, yeah, pretty much went back to work. What did you do? Sixto Diaz Rodriguez was born in Detroit on July 10, 1942. He comes from a family of Mexican laborers, which he's the sixth child. He devoted to music at a very young age thanks to his father, a blues musician. He experienced his childhood in precarious condition, hailing from the impoverished neighborhood of Detroit. At 16, he left school to pursue music and one day he discovered the hippie movement. He began to take an interest in politics and community affairs, and he started writing his own lyrics and singing them with his guitar. From his 20s onwards, he led a very humble life. He worked in construction during the day and sang in bars at night to make ends meet. Even at that time, he was uh, already a truly unique character. He was seen as a vagabond even with people mistaking him from a homeless person wandering the streets of Detroit with his guitar. People wondered if he had a home, and it was even more strange that when he worked on construction, he took his job so seriously that he would show up in a suit. Basically, he's someone who stands out. Living his life as usual, then one evening, while he's singing in a bar, two men come to see him. They love what he does and sign him to their label Sussex Records. And they record his first album, Cold Fact. To make this album, the producers spared no expense. They went to the best studio possible, traveled to London, invited the best musician they could find, etc. With this album, their ambition was to revolutionize music. The album was released in March 1970, and against all expectations, the album is a monumental flop. It's a commercial failure, and nobody hears about Sixto Rodriguez. This failure dealt a major blow to the label's morale. But they say to themselves, well, too bad, the first one didn't work out, we're not losing hope, let's make a second one, just as good, just as well produced, and we'll make it. The name of the second album is Coming From Reality, and with a mindset of perseverance, they tell to themselves that one day they will get what they deserve. But not anytime soon, because the album Coming From Reality, released in November 1971, is once again a commercial failure. A failure from which Sussex will not recover. They decide to stop producing this artist, who is no longer profitable for them. So they abandon him a few weeks before Christmas, which resonates with one of his songs he has written a couple months ago. Cause I lost my job Two weeks before Christmas And I talked to Jesus at the sewer and the Pope said it was none of his goddamn business. Sixto finds himself back at square one. He quits music, work in construction, in the restaurant industry, does garbage collection, and take old jobs to feed his family. He returns to his formal life, ventures into politics, but fails once again. You know the rest, while South Africa idolized him and considered him as a legend, he was in a suit on a construction site working to survive, all the while thinking that it had been 30 years since he had stopped making music. During this time, he earned a degree in philosophy, but was completely unaware that he was a living legend in South Africa. Then he meets Stephen Sugarman, who tells him everything. When he learned the truth, he's 55 years old and filled with wisdom. When asked about the fame, glitter and all that, he doesn't care and just live his life. One question that might arise is where did all the money from Sixto's albums go? In the documentary Searching for Sugar Man, they found the producers of the labels responsible for distributing Sixto's albums. And when asked about the money, no one knows. What is certain is that Sixto didn't earn a single cent despite living in poverty almost all his life. And at that moment, South Africa will learn that Rodriguez is not dead. Imagine their reaction to learn that the greatest legend of their country's music scene who contributed to shaping their mentality and the country's history and whom everyone thought was dead is actually alive. 
American singer Rodriguez is certainly alive and well and with us in the front row tonight. Welcome. We can hear you. I've heard some really riveting tales about oh. your death. I mean, they range from you pouring petrol all over oh. yourself on stage and committing suicide to... For an equivalent that could give you an idea of the scale of the revelation, it's like saying today that Michael Jackson, Kurt Cobain or Tupac Shakur is alive. So, upon learning all this, Sixto says, well, I'll go see them then. He goes to South Africa for a small tour and all six concerts are sold out very quickly. For the people there, he's coming back from the dead. Everyone wants to see him and no one believes. On March 2, 1998, he arrives by plane. When he steps out, he sees limousines, paparazzi, big billboards with his name on them. He signs autograph for hours, even see people with tattoos with his face on them. Seeing all this, he's just amused and remains very calm and he seems not to feel any pressure. During the first concert, on March 6, 1998, he steps on stage and there... He does those six concerts and gives a large portion of the proceeds to his friends and family. He returns to his previous life, where he lived a very, very modest life, to the point where he's still working to make ends meet. As his daughter said, he was rich in many things, but not in material possessions. The lives of all people around him changed after that phone call, but not Sixtos. He remained loyal to his family, to his city, to his friends, to his work, and himself. Until his death on August 8, 2023, he had been living in the same house for over 40 years. Even though in 2022 he won his lawsuit to reclaim the money rightful over to him, this man lived the most extraordinary and strange story of the history of music, but until his last days, he remained simple.